Uh, I'm an electrical engineer and a mechanical engineer. I started my career in 1981 at Hewlett Packard. I was there for seven years, uh, two years at a small company called Analogic. And uh, since 1990, I've been a technology entrepreneur. Um, JLM is my fourth uh, startup that I've started from scratch. The other three were in the Bay Area. Um, technology is something that um, I believe in. I remember in, in 1979, I was an undergrad at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, and we used to run uh, computer programs. And for those of you that are my age, or perhaps a little older, remember that computer programs were written on these things called punch cards. They're little bingo uh, card size, uh, you know, things that had little holes in them. Uh, you write your computer um, code on a punch card, you hand it over to a guy sitting behind the window in a, in a booth, and he would stick it someplace, it would compile it, and uh, maybe half hour later you'd get a printout of um, the syntax errors in your in the code that you'd written, which you'd go back and and uh, you know uh, fix and recompile and bring back to him again. In 1980, a year later, I was I moved out here to California. I was a graduate student um, here at, at Stanford, and the guy um, there was no punch card. There was a there was a what we called a, a time sharing system at Stanford. And you'd go into a room about the size of this room, and there were computer terminals all around, and I could actually punch my code on a you know terminal and submit it electronically, which to me it was just astounding. It was like I no longer had to deal with the punch card. I graduated a year later and I started working at Buell Packard, and I have a computer at my own desk. The transformation over a two-year period, I, I, I just couldn't get over it. As a, as a kid, I was still, you know, in my, you know, teens, in my early 20s, I couldn't get over how quickly it went from being an abstract thing that was sitting behind a, a window in a, in a booth to a thing that was being advertised on TV. I don't know if you remember, if you remember when the IBM PC came out in 1981, they actually ran a lot of... Uh, commercials for it. Again, those of you that are my age or um, older, you remember a uh, Charlie Chaplin type character mm -hmm. doing commercials for, for PCs. And to me, it was incredible that we went from that to us carrying little supercomputers in our pockets, running uh, on battery power. Uh, that is technology, right? It provides efficiency, and uh, for those that are interested in kind of getting on the wave and riding it, it provides financial and intellectual stimulation and rewards um, as well. I believe we are at the onset of a very similar situation. We have an industry that has been around for 135, 140 years. In, in 1878, uh, Thomas Edison invited J.P. Morgan to his house and said, look, I got this thing called a light bulb. And he, um, J.P. Morgan commissioned Thomas Edison to electrify his home. And uh, I don't know if you guys have seen, there's various documentaries on this, on this topic, but if you haven't seen it, I highly, highly recommend it. Um, what Edison did is he put a generator at the basement of J.P. Morgan's. J.P. Morgan, you know, is a, was a financier. His, his dad was a financier. This is the younger... J.P. Morgan, at the time he was about you know, 40 years old. Uh, so he was one of the wealthy guys in New York City, and Edison worked, um, I believe, in uh, Menlo Park, New Jersey. And uh, so he invited them, he put a generator in, in his basement, and um, J.P. Morgan, being interested in essentially financing a whole electrifying uh, revolution, invited a whole bunch of his wealthy buddies to to, the, to his house at this dinner party, and to their surprise, there were no candles, there were no um, you know, oil-based um, you know, lights. They flicked the switch and the lights came on. You have to understand that this is at an age where people didn't understand what electricity was. So when, when these lights came on, there's no smell, there's no heat, there's no mess, there's no 
fuss over turning him on and turning him off, it was a, a lot of people in the audience actually thought that it was a hoax. It was a, it was a trick. That there was some weird uh, thing that had happened that they were not aware of. And in fact, J.P. Morgan's dad, who was the, you know, the elder, uh, the, the, um, you know, the guy that has been established, warned him against this kind of BS um, and, and that you know, he ought to uh, stay away from. It is about 150 years since then. And what, what happened is that generator in uh, Edison's basement was too noisy. So J.P. Morgan said, you know what, I, I love this electric light that you've turned on in my house, but the damn generator is noisy, it keeps us up at night, and, and also it is uh, smelly. Right? So Edison said, look, with proper financing, I'm going to build a power plant and distribute this electricity to everybody over cable. The largest, one of the largest construction projects ever, in, um, up until then anyway, started, which is digging trenches and burying copper cables this thick in diameter, um, in, in sidewalks and streets of Manhattan, getting the town electrified. It is astounding to me that method of doing things has been the way we've done it for 150 years. It's <coughs> awesome, right? We've got a couple of holes in the wall we walk up to, and we can get as much energy as, that we want out of it. We can run lights off of it, we can run electric motors out, uh, off of it, we can run our exercise equipment, our coffee maker, our computers, everything that we do relies on those two holes that we have in the wall. But, more or less, the way we do it today is the same way that it's been done for the last 150 years. Well, you ask, well, what's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with it. I actually think that what the utility companies do for us as citizens um, in this country and around the world is is an awesome thing. The thing that really bothers me about it is the fact that they're really a monopoly. I don't have a choice. If I look at my electric, electric bill and uh, don't like it, don't want to pay some of it, well, you know, good luck with that, <laughs> right? If I look at my electric bill and I feel like they've done something in error, um, you know, they have a choice of disconnecting me if they don't like the way I talk to them. That is monopoly. It's, in my view, un-American at a, at a basic level. Um, so, I think we're presented, I don't think, I believe we're presented with an opportunity to change that. We have the confluence of several different things that are coming together. We've got solar. Silicon, every 18 months, doubles in performance, halves in price. And that's directly silicon related. Factor number two, batteries are coming down in cost. That's an important consideration. We can, batteries are going up in performance and going down in cost. Batteries are essential because renewable energy, as you all know, and I suspect the reason you're here, um, Renewable energy is, is a varied resource. It's not like we can dump, you know, um, natural gas or gasoline or, or diesel into an engine and run it 24 hours a day. We only get five, four or five hours of sun. Wind is very erratic as well. So you need batteries, you need energy storage to balance that out. So cost of batteries are going down. That's the second factor. And the third factor is also silicon related in that the electronics that are required to extract this energy, convert it to a fashion that is workable, store it, and then redistribute it again, are also built using silicon chips, and those things are being reduced in cost as well. When you put those three things together, and the cost of software, and running real-time code to make sure all this stuff works um, you know, seamlessly, you put all that together, we have a real opportunity. Our opportunity is to not necessarily avoid 
the infrastructure that is in place in the form of the power utility, but enhance it and give ourselves a choice. And um, that concept over the last five years has grown into several products that are all targeted at what I would call filling out white space in the, in the big picture of getting us from where we are to energy independence. If you look at uh, what we can do in this building, we can fill the, the roof with solar power, we can have batteries in our warehouse space, and we can decide how much of that energy that comes out of the solar goes into batteries, how much of it goes into powering the building, balance that out accurately, and we have a grid independent, energy independent building. We want to build that, build more of that for our customers. 